Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today I am joined by Michael Levy, a prolific composer for the recreated lyres of antiquity, whose musical mission is to create an entirely new musical genre, which could best be described as a new ancestral music. He is dedicated to reintroducing the recreated lyres, ancient musical modes and intonations back into the modern musical world. You might also recognise him as the man who composed most of the music we use in our videos. So without further ado, let's ask Michael all about his lyre music. Let's start with the inspiration behind your musical quest. Um, why the lyre? Why did you start playing the lyre? Why not? <laughs> um, it dates back my interest in all things ancient and mysterious. Actually, when I was 14 years old, I just happened to find um, a cassette tape back in those days of the late, great David Munro, who was the first person to um, really get into recreating music from the Middle Ages, um, Renaissance and things. And the most fascinating thing about this music is the transporting quality I found. I've never heard this in any other type of music. It literally, I've been to museums and things in the past, but as soon as I heard is music from the time of the Crusades. It was like I was actually in some medieval castle chucking chicken legs over my head. <laughs> this is the um, immersive quality that music has and um, that's got what first got me into, well, ancient type music. Um, as for the actual lyre, um, also when I was 14, I happened to hear um, this LP um, by um, the guitarist, classical guitarists, John Williams and Julian Bream called Together, and it was a magnificent arrangement of um, Ravel's Pan for a Dead Princess. And it, the, the way they were playing it, there's all these little modal sections, it just sounded like a lyre would sound like, and, and that got me thinking way back when I was 14, wow, not a lyre sounds like, we probably never know. But uh, <laughs> then it took about 25 years later until about um, yeah, 2006, I was just randomly looking for some interesting CDs on uh, Amazon and I found something called Music from the Time of Jesus and Jerusalem's Second Temple. This sounds, whoa, this is interesting. And in the liner notes of this thing, um, I found that the lyre that was used, well, the modern evocation of the lyre that was used in the recording was actually played by the Levites who could be my very own ancient Levite ancestors. I mean, that's the ultimate in roots music. So I got my first lyre on eBay of all things. So, <laughs> and that's what I taught myself on and, um, Put a few things on YouTube back in the early days, 2006. YouTube was very new then. Mm. And um, yeah, it just kind of progressed from there. I got comments favourable from people. Um, great thing about YouTube. Uh, there's lots, lots of constru uh, constructive as well as destructive feedback you get. <laughs> and yeah, I just worked my way up through different type of lies. I got a more expensive one in 2011, thanks to someone's recommendation. Then randomly in 2014, I got um, an email from Lutherios in Thessaloniki in Greece, and they're doing exactly the same thing as me, but obviously in Greece, they're actually um, recreating ancient Greek lyres for enthusiastic experimental modern musicians like myself. And wow. that, that, so from thanks to my collaboration with Lutherios, I've acquired Kithara tortoiseshell lyres. Um, here's one of them over here, in fact, which, uh, Big tortoiseshell, amazing things. Uh, actual tortoiseshell foraged from the forests of Thessaloniki with some nice goat's horn. Yeah. Um, bit of a vegetarian's nightmare, but it sounds very nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing, because, I mean, that just makes me think of the mythological begin beginnings of the lyre, where baby Hermes, you know, first day of life, he, he invents the lyre out of a Yeah, I mean, that's been the inspiration of my, late, my latest sort of album. It's actually called The Cave of Hermes, and it's just like imagining... Um, this first tunes Hermes might have played in his cave. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, do you, you have multiple different lyres? And... Uh, yes, um, I can show in some of these lights. Um, Please do. We've got, um, if I can find it, the Kithara, uh, Kithara, I should pronounce it correctly, where we get our modern name for guitar. So this is this beauty over here, and you can see That's it. It's huge. Uh, yeah, fascinating. <laughs> Very deep, almost guitar-like sound. 
Um, so as well as um, wires with tortoiseshell resonators, um, I've got this beautiful thing here as well. This Lutherius kindly sent me. This features in my latest recording as well as the tortoiseshell wires. Notice these beautiful swan necks. And that's um, ties way back into early ancient Greek mythology where Zeus disguised himself as a swan so he could, um, um, uh, what's the word, deceive um, uh, the princess lead leader, I think she was called. So he basically disguised himself as a swan and as she was caressing the swan, she was actually caressing Zeus, the dirty old man. So, uh, <laughs> so that's where these uh, wonderful swan swan necks come from Beautiful. that's some some of my wires and so they're all obviously different sizes and shapes they all need different playing techniques you need to play them differently or is it all sort of a... yeah um the, the the playing techniques are used are a mixture of things a mixture of what i can infer from my like ancient pictures of lyre players so this little beauty here the common when, when you see a lyre player in ancient Greek paintings and, and pottery, you've always got the hand, the left hand blocking specific strings and one of these nice little chunky plectrums doing things. So it's not like a harp where you block strings to stop unwanted sustain. It's actually you're blocking strings that you don't need to play and keeping open the strings you do want to play so you can actually create chords like this. Ah. That sort of idea. So that's inferred from both ancient Greek illustrations on pottery, um, also um, in parts of Africa where the lyre is still played today, the kra in Eritrea, this block and strum, as we call it in the um, lyre circles, this this block and strum technique is alive and well in Eritrea. And um, also, a lot of the things you can do um, where the lyre is still played today um, in Egypt, they play the sim simia. They have this wonderful tremolo sound, so that's where I get my tremolos from. A bit like a mandolin, you can do um, with the plectrum. That sort of thing. And it's all these things that you can't do in a harp or a guitar. It's like playing a harp, guitar and mandolin all in one instrument. It's like an, wow. literally a portable orchestra. <laughs> Amazing. So the way that you've played it there, you'd play the kitara the same way or would you play that a different way? Um, there's um, plenty of, well, there's, the kitara is got a deeper tone to it. And only the professional musicians of ancient Greece played the kitara. Whereas the, the chelis, that's like basically Greek for the tortoiseshell lyre, that was used for like more domestic use. Um, in, and also they played it in symposiums, you know, ancient Greek drinking parties, rough and ready sort of lyre. And also um, Plato in the, um, the Republic advocates teaching young boys age 12 or so when they're learning musical theory to so teach it on the lyre because its notes are clear and pure and stuff like that. So this is the katara. If I can just find my plectrum, which is hiding behind here. There we are. This is an interesting plectrum. It's made of a goat's horn. Oh, wow. So it beats your, the... your, your dun, dunlop rubber things you play guitars with. It's a much deeper sound. Um, the construction of the guitar is interesting. Um, you see um, these very ambiguous looking, what they look like, springs. Now there's two trains of thought about this. Um, some scholars think they were actually used as a vibrato mechanism. Um, and this kitara by Lutherios actually uses a vibrato mechanism. There's, can you see these two leaves up here? So the way they've constructed it, they have like this movable yoke and by moving these, you can create like portamento and vibrato sounds. But um, this, let's say it's only hypothetical uh, because there's actually this part of the katara here between that's called the, the crossbar mm -hmm. and um, yeah, where it joins um, this portion of the lyre. Um, on, 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 in the Parthenon frieze, there's actually a three dimensional surviving fragment of a sculpture of this part of the katara and it's. It, this part of the lyre actually in, encases the crossbar, so that would render any sort of vibrato mechanism um, impossible. So more likely, th th this construction here is probably like a suspension bridge. It's like it provides equal and opposite reaction to the downward pull of the strings. 
So that's what most scholars tend to think, but um, it sounds great with a vibrato mechanism. So if you can improve on what the ancient Greeks were doing, so be it. So that's what I want to do. I want to carry um, this um, sort of new ancestral music, I call it, new compositions for recreated ancient lyres on into the 21st century and beyond. So there you go, that's the Kitara. So everything that you know about the lyre, so um, making the lyre, playing the lyre, is that all from surviving images? Um, yeah, well, most, there's, there are a few tortoiseshell lyres that have survived, like the Elgin lyre in the British Museum. I had the pleasure of seeing that a few years ago. Wow. Um, and also, there's actually ancient Egyptian lyres that survived. I actually got from Lutherios um, a replica of the Leiden lyre, which is preserved in uh, Leiden, and that dates back to about 1500 BC. It's an amazing thing. Wow. Uh, but as far as um, ancient Greek lyres go, only the tortoiseshell lyres seem to have survived, the chalice um, lyres, as they call them. There are no, sadly, no surviving examples of the katara because it must have been very lightly constructed, um, and so and it's out of wood, so wood just isn't as perishable as tortoiseshell and things. So that's probably why none has survived, sadly. Right. That's a bummer, but I mean, at least you've got uh, you've got the tortoiseshell, and that's pretty cool. And obviously, from the images that are surviving, you've been able to, you know, see how they would have played. Yeah, it, and, and the great thing about awesome. tortoiseshell lyres is that because since no tortoiseshells are the same, every tortoiseshell lyre sounds different. So this is another one of Goss from Lutherios. That's a more nicely figured tortoiseshell. And wow. this also re features in my latest recording, The Cave of Hermes, and the track it features in is called Song of the Tortoiseshell Liar. Um, I'm not going to play that now because that was an improvisation, which I can never play again. But just to give you some idea, it's a, much t a, a completely different timbre than the first instrument. <laughs> and so on. A nice delicate sound these beauties have. Let's put him back down. So if they're all different, if they all sound different, how do you go about learning the liar and learning how to play it if every single liar gives a different sound? That's, that's the beauty of it. And, um, well, time back to <laughs> just a bit of an offset. This ties into what Plato says about in the Republic about society being like um, a well-tuned liar. Every component, every individual is different, just like all the different liars, different liar strings. But when they put together, it forms a harmonious union. I love that bit of Plato. Um, but yeah, um, the, the challenge is to actually um, just to take the actual recreated instrument um, and just basically jam on it until you get something that sounds good. That's the great thing about it. And just a little bit about the construction as well. Um, compared to, say, a harp, on lyre strings, the, 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 the ancient Greek lyres, the bass strings are closest to the player instead of further away. And the reason for that is, quite simply, you can actually feel the resonance of the instrument better, the way it's held, um, if the bass strings are closest to you. Uh, whereas harps, the resonance is different, because um, that's the way the sound points out. And also another different, essential difference between the harp and the lyre, um, the defining feature of a lyre is this little bridge over which the strings pass, just like a guitar, and where we get the name guitar from, kitara, the ancient Greek kitara. Um, yeah, so the guitar is like a, fret, a, a fretless guitar, basically. Thank you. 
you want to tell us a little bit about the ancient tuning methods, what that means, and why that's important? Uh, yeah, well, there's um, two components to the ancient tuning methods. First of all, we have what we call the, um, the intonation. That's like the specific um, ratio, how, how the interval, musical intervals are formed. And then the other aspect to that is these wonderful ancient modes that we've almost forgotten about in our modern, very standardised Western music, where all you have are these major and minor keys, where all you can have, no matter what key you're in, is just happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. Whereas all the ancient Greek modes, for example, have all different qualities. So I'm going to dive in, get the technical bit out of the way with, and then I'm going to describe some of the qualities of these wonderful ancient Greek modes with a few demonstrations on some of my more, so some, some more of my instruments, I should say. Um, so I'm at the technical bit now. And you'll have to excuse me because I'm not a mathematician, but um, this is called, I say, intonation. Um, and in antiquity, they used just intonation. What's just intonation? Um, well, that started off the, the basic concept way back in ancient Mesopotamia when they were creating the first fretted lutes. And the Mesopotamians were very good at um, dividing things up. They gave us our seconds and hours and things. And they experimented doing this. Um, to see working out where they could put the frets on, on these lutes. But it wasn't, I say, until uh, the time of Pythagoras, who um, due to his experiments on, on a monochord, which is like one string, and putting different bridges on the string, he actually managed to discover these specific ratios um, that form these beautifully pure musical intervals. And they're much purer than um, the music we're accustomed to in modern equal temperament because they used whole number ratios. So if you think of a whole number, it's more geometrically pure if you put it on a graph or something than all the mixed up ratios we have in equal temperament. So um, let's just describe these wonderful pure ratios. Um, so I'll demonstrate on this little baby. This is um, another of my little lyres. And um, this is made by Lutherios. It's made by a company um, in the States called Marini Made Harps. And I like this one because when I used um, just intonation, because it's um, made by heart makers, the tone is much purer so you can hear the sound better. So um, let's start off with the Pythagorean, um, the Pythagorean fourth, um, which is um, the ratio that Pythagoras discovered was the ratio four, three. Or in other words, if you have a string, and you cut and you sort of divide it three quarters of the way through to give you these nice pure sound. That's 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 a perfect Pythagorean fourth. Um, then if you divide the string into two thirds, that gives you the ratio three two, and that's the perfect fifth. And then um, if you cut the string in half, well divide I should say. Cut um, if you divide the string in half. That's the ratio 2, 1, and that gives you what we call the octave. And that's your three basic intervals in just intonation that you get in Pythagoras. And why is the reason he only uses these three intervals? Well, it's all to some other very quirky thing, um, which is um, his Pythagoras's numerical cosmology. This is where it gets a bit deep and profound. Um, because these ratios that are described, 4, 3, 3, 2, 2, 1, they all fit onto one of these wonderful things, the tetractus. Now, what in the heck is a tetractus? Um, in Pythagor Pythagorism, uh, I can never pronounce that, um, the Pythagoreans who followed and venerated Pythagoras, this was a sacred symbol. Um, it's almost like a mathematical religion because um, the numerical cosmology that this related to um, how, basically, um, the, they thought that the, the tetractus is how space itself was organised. Um, that's because the top point up here, that represents a single point of zero dimensions in space. Then the second row down here, um, because a line can be drawn bet between them, that's one dimension. On the third row, you can draw um, three points to form a triangular plane. There's a triangle that gives you your, um, your two dimensions. And the fourth row, this is where it gets really geeky and mathematical, um, you can actually um, form the four points of a tetrahedron. That's a solid bounded by four triangular faces. In other words, three dimensions. So this to the Pythagoreans 
was how space itself was organized. It also symbolized the four elements of fire, water, um, earth and ur and all things like that and also the, um, other mysterious things. Oh yes, the four points as well make up um, the number 10 and plus and the tetractus is really interesting because four, three, two and one they all add up to, it's like one plus two plus three plus four is ten. And that was mystic, very mysterious to the ancient Greeks. It's like the sum of all components of the universe. And this is where, it gets, this is where the music bit co comes in. Um, because the ratios that Pythagoras discovered can all be fit into this tetractus. The ratio um, of a fourth, four, three, four, three. Very mysterious. The ratio of a fifth, three, two, three, two. Incredibly mysterious. And the ratio of an octave, 2-1, 2-1. Um, and the, the fundamental, or the root, as we call this in our modern music, is just represented by this point of zero dimensions. So um, it was well into this sort of mysteriousness about it. But that didn't really take into account musicality, because then you have, in, in, in interval, you have the third. And this is where, a few hundred years later, we come to this theorist called Ptolemy. And um, he was around um, sort of Greco-Roman guy um, who was a musical theorist and he approached music in a different way. Basically, he was concerned with um, musical sounds being consonant and always nice and harmonious and seeking and he sought a scientific, a scientific rationale to explain why this might be. So he listened to how musicians tune by ear and then worked out the maths from that. So then we came up with the, the third, the pure third. I'll just play a pure third on this wonderful little device. That's the ratio of five to four. Um, this is why um, Pythagoras wasn't really interested in the third, because it wouldn't fit into his holy tetractus. So this is a third, a, a nice pure third. So that's a little bit about um, these intervals. But also there's ancient texts describing how um, these intervals can be used to sweeten the notes of a melodic line. And this ties back into um, the sort of style of lyre playing that I, I do. It's based on this quote. And this is by this guy called um, Pseudo Longinus. And there's a book he wrote called On the Sublime. That's um, basically a first century Roman era, uh, era Greek work on literary criticism. And here's the quote when he talks about um, these beautiful, pure fifths and fourths, and of course he's talking in just intonation because he didn't have equal temperament by then. Uh, melody is sweetened by two paraphonic intervals, the fifth and the fourth. So um, an example, um, just playing any notes at all, these fifths and the fourths sound lovely. So that's just fifths and fourths and it, when you play, um, because the, the ratios are in this lovely whole, whole number ratios, it's very geometric, um, so it's very pure and it's um, almost has a three-dimensional quality to the sound. So that's a little bit um, the crash course in um, Pythagoras and these beautiful pure musical intervals compared to our equal temperament. Um, now onto the modes. Um, Rather than having our very bland palette of um, major and minor keys that we have in Western music these days, um, that's great if you are for symphonies and things where you can transpose the different keys and maintain the same ratio between them because every ratio is artificially made equal, but that makes it slightly out of tune. But yeah, it gave us the works of Mozart and Beethoven and things, but um, equal temperament and the um, major and minor keys can be really quite boring. The whole world of it, musical expression has been lost. And indeed, in The Republic, Plato describes some of the modes, and um, the one he liked most of all, um, it sounds a little bit like a minor key, but not. But it's not just minor, it has this intensity to it. And it also, according to him, inspired bravery in battle. This was the ancient Greek Dorian mode. Now, this is where it gets even more confusing, because in the early Middle Ages, um, scholars gave the original Greek modes the wrong Greek names. So, um, the Dorian mode is the equivalent intervals of E to E on the white notes of the piano, and it was misnamed the Phrygian mode in the Middle Ages. And it sounds like this. And this is an example of this intense sound. Um, that's just, just one of my own little tracks. Um,
kind of minor, but again, it's that intensity. It's very philosophical. I can understand why um, Plato was well into the Dorian mode. And then um, the other modes, which are really interesting, the, the Phrygian mode is the equivalent intervals as D to D on the white notes of the piano. This is gives a very, not a, it's a minor sound, but it's also poignant. And I use this in one of my tracks called O to Ancient Rome. And not so ancient, back in 2018, it ended up on the Mars M&M's advert across the whole of, the, of the America and Canada. And it goes something like this. sound and I, I like the sound of this particularly because it to me it evokes the lost world of antiquity um, which I'm trying to evoke musically in the same way as say an ancient historical author will try and evoke the ancient world through literature I do it through tunes or I attempt to do so and the, this, this is the toolkit the, the ancient modes and the intonations and they're, they're all lovely things just I don't want to don't want to go into too much detail here, but just to run through what the modes were, the ancient Greek Lydian mode is the equivalent in terms of C to C, like a major scale. Um, Phrygian I just mentioned, D to D, Dorian, E to E. Hyperlydian, that's a nice one. That that's, sounds major, but it's got a dreamy quality to it. Um, so it's like the equivalent of intervals is F to F, so it sounds something like this. feminine sound to it. I've used that on quite a few tracks that evoke that sort of feeling like um, what's an album called In um, Echoes of Ancient Rome and one of the tracks is called The Temple of Venus and it's all this kind of sensual sound of this mode. Um, and just uh, briefly uh, mention more of the exotic modes. There's nothing primitive about ancient music because nothing's changed in the way our brains um, structure the world. Um, we're only about what um, about 20 odd generations away from 2000 years ago and yeah the, the Greeks were really precise with their music theory and I'm not going to give everyone a headache with it but they have as well as these modes called diatonic modes because they have seven notes each mode has a diatonic chromatic and, and harmonic variant of it not only that what you call shades as well of the chromatic and the diatonic one and um the most interesting thing is the enharmonic one that uses quarter tones and let's put this one down I'll, sh I'll just briefly show you what a quarter tone sounds like this is called the architas enharmonic genus architas was again some theorist and very exotic very intense sound you get with quarter tones um just get me a little plectrum this lyre is again made by lutherios this is called the lyre of apollo three it's very apollo like and this is what this ancient mode sound like very intense sounding <laughs> demonstration very exotic sound you get with these quarter tones so that's um basically your two components there you've got um your whole number ratios that gives you these really pure geometrically pure um musical intervals and um when you when you're using such pure intervals you don't need all this excess harmony that's why i love lyres because for ages i've been trying to find this uh, a way of playing minimalistic music where you don't need any fancy stuff. I mean, if I was given the choice of listening to some horrible Pagan, what's he called, Paganini Caprice, or some old guy in an Irish pub playing some Irish tunes, I'd listen to the Irish guy any time. I really hate 
things that get really cluttered. That's the beautiful thing when you start using these pure intonations. You don't need anything more complicated. A perfect fifth in just intonation just perfectly frames the melody. That frees up your creativity to do whatever you want with the melody line. So that's why I use these wonderful modes and intonations. Is it meant to be played with other instruments, the lyre? Uh, yes. Or is it, is um, it like a solitary instrument? Because in all the fragments of um, pottery, usually it was accompanied by the orlos, which is basically a double reed pipe. And this ties in with this strange thing we have. It's still taught in schools that harmony was somehow mystically invented in the Middle Ages. It wasn't. The whole thing is a problem, a, a basic logical error, um, confusing the first codification of harmony. That was in the Enchiriadis treaties of the 9th century, back in the early Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, with the first creation of harmony, which goes back to as long as humans have been singing, because every human singer has voices at different pitches. And you've got to sing in the natural consonant harmonies um, in order to sing together. Um, and you can find mm. examples of this, um, say, for example, the Aka Pygmies in Central Africa. They've had no influence at all from the Western world. They also sing in beautiful polyphony. Um, and also ancient texts, they actually mention the use of harmony. Um, Plato in the Republic, when he's describing um, how you best sh should teach young boys the theory of music, um, as well as saying that you should use the notes of the lyre because they're pure and sweet. He also tells his teachers that they should avoid using complex um, performance practices of the day. For example, playing the long note with the short. That's like two uh, and um, two notes and, and two tunes together. All the things that we do today, the ancients were doing it quite happily. The only thing you can't do in just intonation is like transpose to different keys. Right. But then other than that, it's still, they're still instruments that they were created to play with other instruments. Yeah, of course. And the aulos, the aulos, uh, come on, dodge accent, I can't quite pronounce it. That by definition plays two notes at the same time and you can play counterpoint in it. Um, there's like the aulos preserved preserve in the Louvre. Um, and uh, there's some chap called uh, Dr. Barnaby or something. He's specialised in actually playing this thing. You can find him on YouTube. It's amazing. It's this, it sounds like playing two instruments at the same time. It's an amazing thing. That's amazing.
So do you want to tell us a bit about this track, the inspiration for it, the creation of it? What layer you played when you uh, certainly, tell us yeah, a bit about this specific layer? I've just got to find some notes because, um, give me a second, there we go. No worries. Right, yeah. Um, the Hymn to the Stars. Um, I actually used my um, guitar to play this thing. Um, I'm not a natural, I'm not a trained singer or anything. I've got this kind of baritone register, which is quite annoying because it's very limited. I can't sing very high and I can't sing very low. I've only got that an octave to work with. So I just did very simple vocal lines. Feel. And the whole thing is, back in the day in ancient Greece, um, the katara in particular was used for recitations of epic poetry, rhapsodies and things. And for example, um, the Iliad was meant to be performed with musical accompaniments and has all these detailed rhythmic meters and things that you could only remember if, if you're actually humming it, you're reciting it, I should say, to a tune. And the same thing with um, the sixth Orphic hymn um, to the stars, to Astron, because um, I'm, I'm really into astronomy as well as music, so I'm a bit of a geek in that way as well. So I thought this would be a really cool thing to do. And it's Very really cool. inspirational when you hear the, the words of the Orphic hymn. It was imagining, oh, how, what sort of tune might have been sang to this beautiful, the beautiful words. I'll give you, a, a, just so you know what I'm talking about. Here is the Orphic hymn to Astron. Um, <clears throat> With holy voice I call the stars on high, pure sacred lights and genii of the sky. Celestial stars, the progeny of night, in whirling circles bearing your light. Refulgent rays around the heavens you throw, eternal fires the source of all below. With flames significant of fate you shine, and aptly rule for men a path divine. In seven bright zones you run, with wandering flames, and heaven and earth compose your lucid frames. Um, and so on. And it carries on like that. I could recite it all day. It's just very dramatic and you can just imagine some ancient Greek person looking up at what they thought were the rotating celestial spheres, as they thought it was. And, that, and again, that ties into musical intervals as well. They thought that the, all the stars were on this massive sphere because they moved together across the sky. But as this movement itself caused a sound that, that no one else could hear, though they thought Pythagoras might be able to hear it because he managed to deduce and the ratios of these musical intervals I mentioned before. So, <laughs> yeah. So, again, wow. that, the celestial <laughs> spheres, harmonies of the spheres all ties into this as well. So, yeah, the, the six off the hymn. So, I had to go do something really dramatic. Again, the, the musical modes are beautiful. This is in the ancient Greek, um, what you call Phrygian mode, but not to be confused with the medieval Phrygian mode, because in the mid Middle Ages, the medieval scholars gave all the original. Greek modes the wrong Greek names, which is very confusing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so basically the original um, ancient Greek Phrygian mode is the equivalent in terms of D to D on the white notes of the piano. Um, the, the ancient Greeks didn't call them modes, I think they call them toni, and they comprise of um, two t the conjunction of two tetrachords which formed these things. The Greeks were really, really in intricate into their musical theory, so there's nothing simple about or primitive about ancient Greek music, it was really advanced. And that's why I hearken back to um, what's been forgotten in Western music, the beautiful sound of the modes, just intonation, and carrying this forward in, into my own music into the 21st century to find this like spiritual point in music that's been forgotten in our sadly commercialized nightmare of um, contemporary pop music. I just want to do something completely new, um, and create new music for ancient lyres to create this new meditative sound. Just beautiful. Do you have a favourite song that you've ever either, that you've created yourself? Probably, you um, can't think of the word. oh, a couple actually, but one that was very, very nice was, um, if I can just, I could actually give you a quick jam, um, was my, what I called yeah. Hymn to Zeus. Um, and the, Rufus Wainwright himself actually discovered this thing. I'm not sure if it was on YouTube, but he incorporated um, my hymn to Zeus in two scenes of his um, second opera, Hadrian, which is really cool. Um, That's very cool. So it's in a dream scene. Um, I'll just make sure this is in tune. Yeah, so I'll just give you a little rendition. So just imagine your ancient Please Greece do. somewhere about to praise Almighty Zeus. Almighty Zeus, turn up the juice. Here we go.
that's, that's just a few bars of it. Um, so it's uh, this is what I mean. It's in just intonation. So you have all you have is these beautiful, pure intervals of these fifths and fourths and things. That's all you need, and it it's transporting. It literally is like this um, three dimensional sound. Just intonation has compared to to our wish washy equal temperament. Just absolutely beautiful. That was yeah. That was lovely. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate you showing us your technique and all your lies. It's been phenomenal to talk to you. Um, for anyone wanting to listen to Michael's music more, you can find him at his website, ancientliar.com, um, also on Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you can find music, um, YouTube as well. So do make sure to check all of that out. So thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you, Kelly. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my shirt, you can find this design and a bunch more in our shop at worldhistory.store, or you can find the link for it under our merch tab. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you soon with another video.